All right. This morning on our road trip to following Jesus, family intervention. So I've got a little intervention set up up here. Let's go ahead and set up shop. Maybe bring the lights down just a little. Set the mood. Because in any intervention, you've got to feel safe, right? You've got to feel comfortable. And now what I need is someone who will play the part of the counselor who will ask tough questions. And I need two people that are willing to come up and tell everything bad they've ever done. Really? No one? No, look, Stooge's like, me, me, I'll do it. Of course, that's a joke. But it may not need to be. Steve, Pastor Steve, has been uh, teaching for this year on a, a series called The Road to Following Jesus. And so far, we've looked at the mechanics of the car, the family in the car, the circumstances around, including the road and all those good things. He's done a great job. He recapped last Sunday, and so we don't have time to do that today. But did you know, if you miss any one of those, that you can go to the First Baptist website, and there's a link there, and you can go listen to any and all of those sermons uh, from this past year. So you're not out of luck. They're all archived there. So today, as we continue on our road trip to following Jesus, um, it's entitled... Family intervention. I have to tell you, last Sunday morning, Pastor set it up perfectly whenever he called some men to come down that wanted to aggressively show that they were going to lead their families, not to be passive as leaders. I got down here because I was super excited about it until the week happened, but I'll get there in a minute. I was super excited. I got down here. And I don't even know. I just know I, I felt a lot of hot breath going on around me, so I knew there was a whole lot of men down here that were praying to be spiritually aggressive as they led their families. If you were part of that, guys, hold up your hand. I just want to see who's in here. Okay, nice. It's represented in every section. Nice. Good. I got to tell you, Monday, like many of you guys, like all of you, I have a busy schedule. My family keeps a packed out schedule. We keep our calendar full. We have lots of good things to do in our jobs and with our family. We have lots of good opportunities and so much so that there is sometimes I don't get home till really late, like a many of you. Monday night wasn't any exception. I got home late, had some stuff going on here and, and kind of doing a whole bunch of different things. And so I'm driving up our driveway and I feel this need to pray, okay, Lord, it's been a long day. I'm tired. I'm really hoping that once I get up into the house there that the kids are in bed. Okay, wait. I do want to see my kids. So maybe not that they're in bed. Maybe they're in bed but just not asleep yet or maybe asleep and it'll be sweet because my kids are at their best when they're asleep. I just love them the most when they're sleeping. It's so sweet and dirty in my heart. Well, anyway, I uh, hit the door and I crack the door open and I hear some very hearty conversation and all-out disagreements going on. Now, I have to tell you, the very fact that I'm telling you this story reveals that my house isn't always peaceful. All right? It's not. My house resembles more of a war zone than it resembles a house of peace. And why? Because there are five of us in there, five different personalities. There are five strong-willed personalities. There are five opinions. There are five hurts. There are five expectations. And so whenever you put that much together, sometimes it's going to be war. And it was no different Monday night. So when I cracked the door open, I heard a whole bunch of stuff going on. And I was, I was walking in because they were all kind of in the back part of the house. And so I was trying to sneak in thinking, okay, maybe I could dart into the room and they won't notice I came in. And I'm being really passive. I felt this spirit of passivity coming up in me. I was like, I don't want to deal with the fights tonight, God. I've been working for you all day. What do you mean I come into the house and they're all doing things like grades, talking about grades and laundry, and this was the best one. Why is the bathtub clogged up full of dog hair? I'm out. I'm going to leave. I'm out. I don't even want to know what happened there, but it was true. So all these things were going on, but you know what? When I got into my house and I see the first body in the form of my wife and she looks at me, the Lord enabled me to see something different that I've never seen before. And what he enabled me to see was someone who needed me to desperately take hold of the steering wheel of our family and lead. And it was incredible in my house Monday night. Now, I'm not going to tell you what we did. I'm not going to say because here's what happens with us believers, right? Especially as to the rule and list keepers. 
And here we hear what some other Christian or spiritual person's doing. We think, well, that's the standard. I have to do that too. And then when we can't accomplish that, then we start getting frustrated that we can't accomplish that. And then we start pointing the finger at the one that said they really did that. And then we start saying, wow, don't they think they're something? So if you would like to know what happened in the Kelly house on Monday night, I'll tell you later. But I came up with these fun terms here in this Spanish. So if you speak Spanish, this is for you. have never taken an ounce of Spanish. My house went from la casa del trastorno. You like what I did there? The house of upset to la casa de la paz. Doesn't that sound better? La casa de la paz. The house of peace. So much so that the Kellys, yesterday I saw Jackson. He was a little frustrated about having to do something he really didn't want to do, which is pretty much everything. I said, Jackson, <laughs> what are the Kellys a house of? I know, Dad, peace! <laughs> right. At least you're getting it. De la paz. Say it in Spanish, son. It comes out either de la paz. No, anyway. All right, so enough of that. Okay, so all that to set up the fact that my house is sometimes a war zone. My house is sometimes divided. My family, yes, a family, a pastor in a church is family, sometimes is divided. Sometimes we struggle. Many times we battle. So this morning... Our topic is the road trip to following Jesus, family intervention, okay? And so the question that's posed out there is kind of like the elephant that's in the room here is do we need an intervention? I don't know. Our definition for intervention this morning is an event where reality and truth are exposed. Now that's mine. I got a a cool email from somebody this week. Uh, that they uh, saw something online. And here's a Mayo Clinic's definition of an intervention. An intervention is a gathering of close friends, family, and colleagues who meet to persuade a person or people to seek help or treatment for a problem. Okay, so set some ground rules here. We can't nudge each other when he says he's talking about you. We don't want to stand up and point fingers. We don't want to call names only unless you think it's going to solve something. All right, that's the ground rules. All right. We're going to be studying out of uh, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. And in the book of 1 Corinthians, a guy named Paul wrote that. Interesting enough, this past week, I heard two different challenges about Paul and his authority or his credibility. One of them I was just hearing as a a spectator. The other one was directly a one-on-one conversation I was having with someone. So I'm pretty, uh, uh, I guess, uh, naive on my road trip and following Jesus that I didn't really know that there was a growing thought of Paul not being credible. Do you guys realize the implications if Paul wasn't credible? That's a lot of implications. So I did some research, and this is just a bonus today, okay? I looked uh, at several commentaries on the life of Paul. I found out that no more than 50-something years after Paul had written his letters, a historical figure that is historically recorded actually links Paul to those letters and links Paul to the apostles, which is really good because it's not just the Bible, it's history. And so if you're really going to be a student of the Word and you really want to know what's true and right, it's really good when you can get history to support the Word of God. And you can do that over and over in the uh, Establishing Paul as apostle wasn't any exception. But you know, that wasn't enough. I thought, okay, that was thousands of years ago. How do I know it didn't change through the thousands of years? And it still felt like there was a hole in that. Now, let me just tell you, the thought regarding Paul, around Paul, and his credibility is this. He actually added some things to the message of Jesus and distorted it and actually made a religion that wasn't ever supposed to be called Christianity. That's one thought. Another thought is this, that Paul really wasn't an apostle because he wasn't chosen like the other 12 apostles and he didn't walk side by side with Jesus when Jesus was on earth teaching. And so Paul isn't credible. And along with that thought, and this was a conversation I had, was this. Paul was so influenced by the culture that was around him that all of his writings were no more than just trying to speak against the culture he was around. So I'm thinking, wow, those are some pretty compelling arguments. And if that's true, we're all in trouble when it comes to the New Testament, if that's true. So I felt the need to set this straight. Second Peter 3.15, to me, is like, 
praise God for the word of God. Second Peter 3, 15 and 16 says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with the Lord, wrote with the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letter his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. And to that I say, thank you, Peter. There's no question on Peter's apostleship. There's no question. Nobody really ever questions Peter. There's a few things out there about Second Peter not being authentic, but come on, really? So nobody really questions Peter. And the coolest thing about God's word is Peter actually completely blows it out of the water that Paul is writing scripture. Do you see that? As other scriptures. Paul's influence is real. It's true. I love that. That was super exciting. So that gives us some credibility as we look at the book of 1 Corinthians. All right. Now here's what's going on in 1 Corinthians. There's a church in Cor Corinth. It's not very old. Less than 25 year old church. It's not even that old because between the time of the first church of Corinth and Jesus' earthly ministry can't be any more than 25 years. So in that time period, this church is getting started. How many of you all can remember 25 years ago? Yeah. If you are in your 40s, late 30s, 25 years ago doesn't seem like that long ago and above that age. But if you're 20, 25 years ago seems like a long time because you don't have 25 years. And that was really profound. But anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> 25 years. Julie and I are going to celebrate 20 years of marriage next uh, year. And I'm thinking, wow, where in the world did 20 years go? I mean, if you think back to 25 years ago, for the older folks in the crowd, it doesn't seem like that long. Well, 25 years, no more than that, is when this church would be able to look back at Jesus' actual life and ministry on earth. Not very long has passed. And the reason I bring that up is because there's an interesting thing that this points out. Paul is writing to this first church. We're going to call it First Church of Corinth because it's a church there. He's writing to this church because it needs an intervention. That close to the time Jesus actually walked the earth. That close. We're thousands of years past that. So if the First Church of Corinth needed an intervention, 20-something years past, the beginning of the church, how much more? Do we need an intervention? So I'm really excited about where we're going to go this morning, what we're going to study. There's a lot of information, and I pray, pray. I have a lot of people praying this week. It's been so encouraging, so many different influences the Lord's placed in my life this week for this part of the sermon, this part of the teaching to come out just the way the Holy Spirit wants it to come out. So I pray. Pray with me, Father. Power of the Holy Spirit come upon this place in fullness. Lord Jesus, we ask you to help us overcome the distractions that are around us, the way our morning started, the way we came in here, all those things that are fighting for our attention. Lord, we bring them before you and we leave them there. Open our hearts, our ears, our minds. Soften our hearts so we can hear from you, Lord, from what Paul taught this church. Help us to apply it in a great way. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Paul starts this letter of Corinthians, and what we're going to do, I didn't know any other way to do this, but we're going to be in chapter 12 for the majority of the time. Don't go there yet, because I want you to be able to flip through your Bible a little bit. We're going to be in chapter 12 for the majority of the time. I only know how, we're going to have to just break this thing down and eat it like it's a good piece of cheesecake, okay? That's the only way I know how to do this. But some context will come in here and there. But the church in Corinth is an interesting church. Paul actually shows up in Corinth to plant this church. And his, uh, his, the reason he went there in the first place was to minister to Jews. And you know what those God-fearing chosen Jews did to Paul? They did not say, we're so glad you're here. Welcome. Come in. Teach us everything you know. We're excited. No. They actually wanted to kill him. You get out of here. Those God-fearing people say, we want to kill you. As if killing the Messiah wasn't enough. They're still at it. So Paul goes to Corinth. He's like, you know what? He actually does this really cool thing. He takes off his clothes and he shakes it out in front of him as a sign of, I'm done with you people. Wow. Now that must have been like a modern day slap in the face. Any volunteers? No, I'm just kidding. Somebody need to be awake. Well, Paul, is, he changes the plan there. Immediately goes to the Gentiles. He immediately finds some believers who are actually following the way of Christ. 
And then this church begins, all right? And that's how Paul is a part of the church planning of the church in Corinth. All right, so some time passes, and he writes this letter to him. And here's what's happening for this much, and then we'll get into it. The church in Corinth have got really, gotten really confused by the influence of their culture. And their culture has lots and lots of influence in things that are not godly. They're doing really cool things with uh, um, kind of magical type things, mystical type things. And the church, first church at Corinth, is really drawn in and kind of uh, allured to those kind of things because they look cool. So Paul recognizes he hears something's going on in this church. I said earlier, when I walked in my house Monday night, the Lord allowed me to see something that I normally wouldn't have seen. Paul was allowed by God to see something in this church that he wouldn't have normally been able to see. And what is that? We're going to get there. So in chapter 1 of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, you are an incredibly gifted body of Christ. You are an incredibly gifted church. You know what? This is an incredibly gifted church. We have so many people in here that have such incredible gifts, people who can cook, people who can sing, people who can encourage, people who can give. We have such an incredible body of gifted people right here at First Baptist Church. The same was true in the First Corinthian church there. They had an incredible group of gifted people. And Paul points that out in chapter 1. Chapter 3, Paul says, there's a problem. You all are completely unspiritual. They're gifted, yet they're unspiritual. So I want you to let that float around in your mind as we go towards family intervention here. This church on the outside looked really, really good. They were gifted. Paul says that. He points it out to start with. And just shortly into his letter, he says, but you are immature. That was the other one I missed there. You're immature and you're very unspiritual. On the outside, you look gifted. You're great and you are. But something else is going on there that causes immaturity and unspirituality. Interesting. So then we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay, now you can go there. And if you wanted to... Look and make sure that I uh, did that right. First Corinthians 1 is where he encourages him. First Corinthians 3 is where he points out the problem. First Corinthians 12 is where he really drops the bomb of intervention on this church. Okay, so let's go there. The body is a unit, chapter 12, verse 12. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. Like I told you, we're going to cut this thing down and eat it up a little bit. Paul is talking about a literal body like this. Literal body. Now, you guys can relate to this. If you're in your age, older age and stuff, you say, oh, my knee hurts, it's going to rain. If you feel the urge right now to say, no, really, it does that, then you know, I'm definitely talking to you. You understand this concept of a body. Paul is incredible as he's going to illustrate to this church where, they found, where their problem is, the roots of where their problem is, and the intervention that he needs to do there. But it's really not Paul that's doing the intervention, and we're going to see here in a minute what it is. All right, so it's, the body is many members. I mean, just look at your fingers. That's a lot of different stuff going on there. Right? Your toes and all that stuff. There's a lot that make up your body, yet it's one body. Now listen to this. We could just do this one verse right here, and we could talk about this, and we could just chew this up, and we could leave it there, and it'd probably be enough challenge, but boy, do we have a lot to do this morning. And then it says, Paul says this. So it is with Christ. Just like you are many... So it is with Christ, the body of Christ. Isn't that cool? I know you've probably heard this in some time, but keep in mind what Paul's trying to go up against at the first church of Corinth there. Though we are many of us, we make one body. This morning we're going to do some tough work at looking about what would our reflection of our body be. How many of you guys looked in the mirror this morning before you left? I mean, you should have looked in the mirror before you left. Right. right, we all do. Why? We want to make sure everything's in order. We want to make sure everything's okay. Why? Because there are going to be other people that are going to look at us. 
We certainly don't want hair out of place or stuff hanging from our nose or clothes that need to be zipped up, unzipped, that kind of stuff. So we check it out in the mirror, right? Well, Paul is saying, just like that physical body, you're watching a reflection of it, you're keeping up with it. So is the body of Christ called the local church. So I wonder just for a moment to get this thinking in your mind too. Now, welcome to my world all week long of, okay, how does this all come together? I'm taking you along the process. If we were looking in the mirror of he who put this body together, what is the reflection we see today? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? All right, let's move on. All right, Um, verse 13. For we all baptize into one well, I'm sorry, we all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given the one spirit to drink. Now, this is an interesting verse. It's very interesting because it uses the word spirit twice, and then it uses the word spirit in the context of drinking the spirit. Now, if we're taking literal, Paul's going from talking about a literal body to an illustration of the body of Christ. Now he goes to talking about something that's spiritual. Now, how do you, what do you do with this? Okay, is Paul illustrating something that's really not for real here? Uh, What's going on? As we're going to travel through the rest of these verses in our text this morning, the two words, he, the spirit used there, is going to be that work at power that we've got to focus on this morning. The thing that helped me see things different Monday night when I walked in my house was the Holy Spirit. The thing that helped Paul see the difference in this church was the Holy Spirit. Not wisdom, not greatness, none of that stuff. The Holy Spirit. He provided that. All right, so let's talk just a minute about the Holy Spirit. All right? Get my notes together here. All right, so Paul's done a great job of teaching about the body being one. If you look at verse 14, he says, Now the body... Nope, I'm ahead of myself. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, that's right. For just if each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. All right, I meant to go there first. A little further teaching there before we talk about the Spirit. Okay, in Romans 12, 4, and 5, the same concept of one body is mentioned. And it says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. The same thing that Paul reveals to the first church in Corinth about this idea of being one body. All right, now, it's interesting because in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, we see Jesus when he calls Paul. Because you guys know what Paul did before he was, he was Saul, before he was Paul. He actually went around trying to get rid of Christians. And so whenever he met Jesus, Jesus says this to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? All right, so we, we've unpacked this far enough to see that Jesus sees himself as the church, as the body. And so he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Was Jesus referring to why are you saying things against me personally? Why are you pointing me out personally? No, we see a great sense of unity here of this whole body idea of how that all works together when Jesus says, why do you persecute me? Jesus saw himself as that body. Jesus is the head of the body that Paul is trying to convey to these Corinthians. Okay, so through the Spirit, through the power of the Spirit is where Paul is coming from. And then he even teaches, here's what brings you together. The one Spirit you were baptized into and the Spirit that you drank. Now that's some kind of crazy language, especially in a Baptist church. Now we all agree with the power of the Holy Spirit. We all agree that the Spirit can move. We all agree that it's real. But something that I'm afraid that we do is make the Holy Spirit an it and not a he. I heard somebody really wise recently say, you know what? I think maybe you, and they're talking to me personally, consider the Holy Spirit as he and not it. You can't have a relationship with an it, but you can have a relationship with a he. So Jesus says the Holy Spirit is what brings the church together. It's the Holy Spirit is what bound you together. And Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? The church. 
It's the Holy Spirit that is working to cause that unity together. Now, real quick, let's look at some of the, deals, uh, some of the ideas of the Holy Spirit. This idea of to drink of water. You guys have been really thirsty and you take a drink. The water isn't at its best when it stays in your mouth, right? When it stays in your mouth, it just gets warm and then you're like, what do you want to do with it at that point? Spit it out. But the water, whenever it's cool and you get a drink of it and you swallow it, it becomes part of you. Yes? You can't do anything else with this. That's what the scripture says right there. And if Paul is credible, he says, you were given the one spirit to drink. What does that mean? Given the one spirit to drink. All right. In John chapter uh, 16, Jesus is teaching his disciples. You can go there if you'd like and just kind of follow them. But I'm going to summarize for time. In John chapter 16, it's getting the bottleneck of when Jesus is about to uh, face the cross and death and resurrection. All those things are about to be in motion. And he gathers up the disciples and he gives this last minute teaching. In John chapter 16, he says, It is for your good that I go away because if I don't go away, then the Holy Spirit won't come. He Over and over it says he won't come. He's called the advocate. He's called the comforter. He's called the counselor. Unless, Jesus says, unless I go away, he won't come. And when he comes, he has a clear job. And there are three things that stood out to me from John chapter 16 that he will do. He will convict. Some of your verses, some of your versions may say he will prove. What will he convict of and what what will he prove of? Convict the world of where it's wrong. He will prove to the world of where it's wrong. And that's in chapter 16, verse 8. The second thing the Holy Spirit will do that stood out to me from that is the Holy Spirit will guide people into all truth. And that's in verse 13 of John 16. He will guide people into all truth. I don't know about you all, but I love the idea of He, the Holy Spirit, one being powerful because that's what the Bible calls Him, guiding me. There are so many times that I feel like I face things that I don't even know what to do with. How encouraging and comforting and incredible it is that the Holy Spirit guides. And the third thing that really stood out to me in verse 14 is he will make known. The Holy Spirit's job will be to make known. Now, put this all together, these ideas of Paul, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you. We all drink the one spirit. We're all baptized into the one spirit. We, that's what put us together as part of the body. And that same spirit convicts and guides and makes known things. That's not a passive thing. That is an active thing. That wasn't just going on in the first church of Corinth. That is to go on in our church. The Holy Spirit is still working among us in power, which is incredible to me. All right. Uh, In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating, he gave them this command, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father, my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's kind of a cool text right there. Can you imagine the anticipation in those disciples when Jesus said, Hey, hang out here. Don't go anywhere. The best is yet to come. Trust me on this. How exciting is that? And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of what? Those of you that grew up in church, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. What does a temple do? Look pretty on the outside and draw people to it because it looks cool? What is the purpose of a temple? To contain something. And is your body as a temple to contain the one you drink, the Holy Spirit? Isn't this some cool stuff? It goes on to say, Holy Spirit, who is in you. Not an idea. Not when you went through the baptistry. Okay, there he was and now he fleeted off somewhere else. No. Holy Spirit in you. He goes on to say, whom you have received from God. God gave that. Isn't that awesome? You're not on your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Why should we want to honor God with our body? If this Holy Spirit idea and all this stuff is right that Paul's teaching... The reason we should want to honor God with our bodies is because we realize it's not our own body. The verse in Romans said we each belong to, or we belong to each other. As the body of Christ, we should want to honor our bodies because we have the big picture that it's not just us and us alone. Let's see how Paul develops this some more in 1 Corinthians 12. Now the body is made up of uh, of one part, but not of one part, but many. Verse 15 If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, 
it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not be, not for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Okay, so Paul's just going into some literal, reasonable things. You don't have to be a believer. You don't have to, it doesn't matter how the culture's influenced you when it comes to this kind of teaching. This is common sense. If everything were an ear and you walked around and functioned as if everything were an ear, you're going to be pretty handicapped, right? And so Paul's saying, literally speaking, on your body, if everything was a big toe, you're going to look disgusting. (laughs) I've never seen a pretty big toe. And some of you are thinking, is he talking about my toe? Speaking of that, individual parts, and we're about to go there about how this church in Corinth had elevated some parts that maybe they shouldn't have. Have you ever thought about your big toe much? Do you realize how important your big toe is? You can't really stand up. I was practicing this, and if you try to pull your... Stand up on your heels without your big toe, and you're going to get tired really fast, and you're probably going to topple over. Your big toe, just that one little thing is so important to the entire body. And this will be important as we develop this some more. But look at this verse 18. But in fact, when Paul says that, you can trust this. In fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Okay, now we have to do some work here. Paul's talking about a physical body, of course. He's arranged them exactly how, God has arranged them exactly how he wants them to be. Wasn't an accident. God did that. He arranged them. Now let's talk about the spiritual body of Christ. God has arranged them exactly how he wants them to be. You know, I've been uh, in church work now for about 18 years, and I've been in two churches in that time on staff. So I've got to see lots of different dynamics of church body and families and all that kind of stuff. And do you know it is absolutely no mistake. God always places people in his body exactly where he needs them. But unfortunately, sometimes the parts of the body want to be what other parts of the body are. Or sometimes the parts of the body don't want to be the part of the the body they are and they just want to kind of set back and look. I want you to think about just for a moment, say the right side of your physical body decided it didn't want to play nice. You're going to look like a freak. Anytime you go to move, anytime you go to operate, if the right side of your body isn't cooperating, you're in trouble. You're not going to get very far. You're not going to get very much done. And people are going to be staring at you. Spiritual body. If one member that God has placed together fails to do what God has placed that member to do, the body's going to look weird. The body's not going to function correctly. And Paul is saying this to the first church at Corinth. You are not functioning correctly. Let's get a little deeper into what he's talking about. Verse 19, if, if they were all one part, where would the whole body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unrep- unpresentable, we tr- are treated with special modesty. While we... Pr- while Our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there, so that, don't miss this part, so that there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. So what is he talking? Apparently what was going on here, the culture in Corinth was influencing this church, and there are lots of kind of crazy, mystic type things going on. And a lot of it had to do around the topic of uh, fortune telling. We could also call that prophecy if you want to bring it to the Bible. And a lot of it was tongue speaking. People were going around speaking in tongues a lot. Not in necessarily the first church of Corinth, but outside. This was something that was shown as, wow, they are so smart. They got this enlightenment. And so this church was being influenced by the culture to say, well, if I can't, call out some cool things that are going to happen, then something's wrong with me. Or if I can't show this evidence that I'm super spiritual, 
like through speaking through tongues, something's wrong with me. So what has happened? And we'd have to go all the way through the end of 1 Corinthians and hit 2 Corinthians to get all this to come together. But what's happened is these people are like, if you can speak prophecy and you can speak in tongues, then you are it. Let's put the spotlight on them. The rest of you fall back. And I wish it stopped there. It wasn't just about that. It was about rich people and poor people. The rich people in the first church of Corinth had the spotlight on them saying, wow, they are so great. Something kind of like in our culture. If you've got a lot of money coming in, if you're getting all these blessings and you must be living right, you guys heard that kind of theology. But if you're poor, if you don't have this, that, and the other, then maybe you have sin in your life and you should seek God to get it right. That theology falls apart when you get here because Paul says, you know what? Not only are you trying to elevate the people that are showing this external stuff just because they're being really loud, but you're also pushing the people that are most needed to the back. And so that's why he puts it down there. The, the parts that are less honorable, you're trying to elevate. And so what basically Paul is saying is, it's not always the mouth of the body that needs to be spotlight. Sometimes it's the big toe that actually holds the body up. So Paul is using this wonderful argument, this wonderful illustration that's speaking clear to the first church at Corinth, and I think it speaks to us as well. Verse 24, while... Um, no, so that there, verse 25, I want to recap that. So there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So what causes division in the body of Christ according to what Paul just taught the first church at Corinth? What causes the division is when people begin acting out of their own and not acting out of the power of the Holy Spirit who called them in the first place. That's what Paul's explaining here. Verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. This morning I saw this really cool thing. And it's a great illustration for this point. Because this is going to take us into kind of our, where we're going here in our family intervention. Is uh, Reese's grandson came running in this morning. And he says, Papa! You know, and he's running as fast as he can. And Reese scoops down and picks this little guy up and gives him a kiss. So happy to see him. It's mutual. Those two guys, the big guy and the little guy, were super excited to see each other. Why? Because they are family. I have a good friend in my life that has prayed with me a lot, encouraging me. This is interesting, too. And uh, he was gone all last week on business and I wanted to hang out with him a little bit before today and just pray with him and kind of talk about some stuff. And, and so I was texting with him. He says, well, I'm kind of open Saturday and all this stuff. And I said, he'd been gone all week. So I sent the response of, yeah, if that works, that's good. But you should really spend time with your family. And his response to me was, you are family. Oh, yeah, that's exactly right. You are family. Oh, I love it. All right. So before we go down that, you guys keep that in mind. Why is the body of Christ under attack? Why are we under attack? We have to go to John 17 to see that. This is Jesus right before he's arrested. Jesus is praying. The ultimate credibility of Jesus talking here. And here's what Jesus says. And by the way, if you never knew this, you're going to get to learn something cool today. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for us. John chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Do you you catch that? When Jesus prayed for all those who will believe, he didn't pray, Lord, will you make them successful? God, will you give them great gifts and talents and abilities Will you give them ideas of how to build big churches and impact communities? Will you help them go on incredible mission trips and do great things? Will you, will you? He prayed one simple thing. Will you make them one? And he goes on. If that weren't enough, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know 
that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. This is some deep theology in Jesus' prayer for us. 25, righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. And listen to this. And that I myself, I myself may be in them. Man, that's an incredible unity for God, the Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now, what was Paul teaching to the Corinthian First Church of Corinth? What did they, where did the Spirit go? In. Jesus said, that I may be in them, that God may be in us. The Bible calls God love, right? Can't disagree with that because God is love. If God, through himself, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is here, that is where we have the capability to love. And love is what actually holds a family together. Love is what is the sustainer of the family. You know... That a strong-willed personality can hold a family together by raising a dominant hand and saying, this is how it will be, you all just follow and like it. That can happen. People can make it through discipline and willpower. Families can survive without God, but there's something wrong and something missing. And so for us, as an example, we can look at the first church of Corinth and they needed an intervention. In your bulletin there... um, I want to give you some of those lines. Facts about human relationships, okay? Number one, human relationships are needed. We need those. We are wired that way. You can't go very long without having some sort of interaction. Human relationships are needed. Second, human relationships are good. God created them that way. It's not good for man to be alone. Therefore, he showed up and here was all paradise and glory. Not really, but relationships are are good. Human relationships are good. Third fact about human relationships is they are difficult. Human relationships are difficult. If you've ever had one relationship in your life, you know that is true. The last one there about fact about a human relationship, they're important. Why are they important? Because we're to be a body. All right, now, this is for the believers in the house. Okay, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you haven't gone down that path yet, if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, drank the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about, if you haven't been there yet, you're exempt from this. But if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've met him and the Holy Spirit has uh, given you power to salvation, this is for you. The body of Christ, we are under attack. Why? Because Jesus prayed that we'd be one. Why does that put us under attack? It's easy. Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy counterfeits. He masquerades as an angel of light. He's going to do anything and everything he can do to destroy that which God puts together. And what we've learned just from our study this morning is God has put the body of Christ together. And we are under attack. Is the very heart of God the very nature, the very being and essence and plan of God for us to be one. And unfortunately, I feel sometimes when we come together as a family, if you're a believer here this morning, you don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church, Salem Springs. It's not what I'm talking about. If you're a believer, follower of Jesus Christ, experience the power of the Holy Spirit, We are to be one. And sometimes I sense that we're really not. I don't really see, myself included, us trying to scoop up other people and love on them. I'm so excited to see you, like between a grandpa and a grandson. I don't see that too often. What I do see is a lot of comparison going on. I see a lot of people pointing fingers at the people that should be operating as the body. And I think what we've done, First Baptist Church, 
We're not talking to any other church, and that may apply to them, but hey, this is our family intervention here. What I feel like we need to talk about is where you fit in the body of Christ. You're here this morning. If you're a believer, you fit in the body of Christ. You have a function. But knowing that, we are under attack, aren't we? We're under attack to be deceived, and we're under attack to be confused. And you know how the best way the enemy does that? The best way he does it is he brings up things and he puts us in bondage. Come in the form of some of our past mistakes. He's really good at accusing us to remember what you did then. You're no good. You can't serve as a part of the body of church because of your past mistakes. Or we get addictions in our life. And with those addictions, we feel like, ah, oh, if people really knew the real me, they wouldn't accept me. I'm the only one that struggles. I want to tell you something, family. You are not the only one who struggles. If you've bought the lie that you have a sin that nobody else has, I'll guarantee you about 90% of the people in here have that same problem. I've worked with students long enough to know that that's how the enemy works, and myself too. If you have an addiction in your life, rest assured you're not alone with that. The enemy attacks the body through making us depressed. The enemy attacks the body by causing confusion. There was a misunderstanding in communication. That was this. That was that he causes confusion and then we get at odds and we start biting at each other. And that's not how the body of Christ was meant to operate. Broken promises. The enemy attacks on our families and our relationships. Whenever things go wrong and we break a promise that we really meant to keep, nobody usually makes a promise that they intend to break. Everybody starts out wanting to keep them, but sometimes it doesn't work. This one's huge. The enemy attacks us by comparison. If only I were as organized as. If only I made the kind of money as. If only I could do this, then I would be so much better. I'm less than because I can't do those things like that person can. Lack of self-worth. The enemy comes at us and he says, you're not worth anything. You're right. God knows everything and he's, Satan's crafty. He doesn't just show up like you think he might. But he's going to remind you, yeah, you're worthless and God looks at you like that. He does that. And I have so many more that I didn't have things to put them on so we'll go through them. Lying. Maybe lying is what the enemy's using in your life to separate you from the body of Christ to be not being able to use. Maybe you've actually bought a lie at some point in your life that is hindering you. That is like the big toe of your whole body that's been cut off and you can't seem to function. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's unfaithfulness. Maybe somebody in a relationship has hurt you terribly bad. Maybe it's even a friendship. Somebody's been unfaithful to something they said they would be faithful to you about. That hinders you because you put your walls up and whenever you have a wall up, you can't function as the correct body of Christ. Fear. And this one's huge. The fear of what will they know if they really know the real me? The fear of if this ever came out, people wouldn't know what to do with that. Lust. Not just in a sexual way, while that's huge, but lust for things of this world. That will hinder the body and rejection. We're so afraid of a body of Christ, in the body of Christ, that we might be rejected by another member of it. And so we don't want to put ourselves out there because we don't want to suffer rejection. So how do we deal with all of this? How in the world do we combat all this that's being flooded our way, that is seeking and in many ways being successful? and hindering us as the active body of Christ. Remember that's something I talked about that came up in me Monday night? My normal mode of operation Monday night would have been in, tongue lash everybody, tranquilize them, and then enjoy a peaceful house. <laughs> something welled up, the Holy Spirit welled up and said, Jason, lead. And Jason led, praise God, that's how you overcome. Grab my family. And we ask God for peace. 
Now listen, there's something true you've got to know about peace. Peace is not passive. Peace doesn't come just because you sit by and watch and hope it comes. Peace isn't something you do by holding your hands up and hum. You have to fight for peace. You've got to fight. And as a body of Christ, if we're one body and one of us fails to fight, hopefully the other will fight enough, but what happens if two or more or three or five or ten don't fight? Then what happens to the body? I had a very cool experience in my life recently. And you guys know, many, many of you know my story. Uh, raised in a Baptist church. I was lost all through the Baptist church. Mom and dad were super faithful. I went, didn't like it. Um, as soon as I could get a job, I got a job. Conveniently had to work every Sunday, that kind of thing. And when I was, in, when I was 23 years old, I actually met Jesus. Oh, Wow, that's what I miss. It's not about all this other stuff that was confusing me. So I met Jesus at that point, And he changed the trajectory of my life like nothing else. I thought it was going to be in a, the, the travel industry for my career. Praise God, it busted when the internet came, came about. But he changed the path of my life when I met him. In this process, he started guiding and leading me. But do you want to know what? I knew the whole power of the Holy Spirit was real. I knew what the Bible said about it somewhat. But I limited, limited God to the Holy Spirit was just for getting me saved. And I was told as a young youth pastor in classes that I took through some Southern Baptist well-meaning schools that the Holy Spirit, you get him at fullness, at salvation, and that's all you get. Okay, that may be true, but you can't stop there. Because I'm going to confess to you, family, my family. I've spent my majority of my Christian life completely spiritually underwhelmed. Is this it? If the power of the Holy Spirit is really this great, is this it? Another confession to you, my family. There's nothing, hardly anything up to this point in my ministry as a youth pastor that I can't say I had a part of. In other words, I could have done it without the help of the Holy Spirit. It's been some great things. Yeah, we've seen some people come to salvation. Yeah, and I know God took care of that. But from my perspective, to be completely honest, and Jesus says, I'm going to be honest with you. Unless I go away, Spirit won't come. Doesn't insinuate Jesus lied before. It's just this for uh, emphasis. So I tell you the truth that there's a whole lot of Jason that's been a part of Jason as youth pastor and just a little bit of the Holy Spirit. And I want something different than that. I don't want to go home at the end of the day and be like, okay, God, what part did you have in that and have to work really hard and try to have to make things come together and say, that was the Holy Spirit. But on the time of my mind saying, really? So on Friday, February the 8th, less than a month ago, I had an incredible opportunity to uh, get prayed over by a couple. And this couple spoke some truth into my life that helped me in a way that I want you all to experience. It was awesome. It was hard because the light had to be shown on some of these problems that was in this guy's life. The light had to show some different areas of where I was holding back. And what I learned through that experience was the Holy Spirit can't show up in full power in your life if there is anything hidden in the darkness. Anything at all. And it may be huge, or it may be teeny tiny. But anything that's hidden in the darkness, part of the body, the Holy Spirit will not come in fullness and power. Can't. There's a problem there. There's a block there. There's a handicap and a hindrance there. Yeah, sure, God is greater, but God wants our surrender. That's biblical. So in this time, this couple was praying, and they didn't know me that well. But they knew some things that the Spirit laid on their heart, which 
drove me to believe, oh, the Spirit is working here because how would they know this kind of stuff? wasn't anything creepy, don't get me wrong. So thankful for that because I was able to voice some things to God, not to those people, not to anybody else, voice some things to God about some rejection that I was carrying through my life from some childhood stuff, some abandonment that I felt. And I I think in my mind, I subconsciously thought, well, I'm just going to hold back a little here in some other areas that the Lord pointed out to me needed to be dealt with. And do you know it went something like this? God. And there's a verse in the Bible that says he makes us able to call him Abba, which means dad, daddy. So my prayer went something like this, and I've never done it like this before. Daddy. You try to call God that. And if something doesn't come up inside you of life, Daddy, I have associated myself with, and I listed it, and I'm sorry. Another one, Daddy, I have associated myself with, and I am sorry. Another one, Daddy, I have been a part of, and I'm sorry. And do you want to know what? I went through four things, and I don't have time to go through what they were for me. I went through four things, and ever since that, freedom in this guy's life. Not because there was some gift that somebody had, and not because anything other than the Holy Spirit broke through in my life. The power of the Holy Spirit that I drank at salvation was let free. Praise God. I have different eyes. Some of you say, Yeah, it's not even been a month. This has been the best month of my life. I don't care why you say your thing on it. It's been the best month ever. I see everything differently. Everything. I'm different at home. I see my, my, my job as a dad differently. I see my job as a youth pastor differently. And I see you all differently. You're my family. We're going to spend eternity together, aren't we? Why wait until we have to get there and be like, oh, that's what I held back. Why wait? So this morning, the invitation is clear and easy. You already know, family, if there's something inside you that's in the dark. And it may be buried so deep that you don't see how any way possible it can ever be dug up. But you know what? If you want to experience the fullness of that drink of the Holy Spirit. If you want to experience that, let the light of the Holy Spirit shine on it. And you know the best way to let the light of the Holy Spirit shine on it? It's through confession. James says you confess one to another and then what happens? Times of healing comes. If you had a cold, if you had the flu, if you had a broken bone, your physical body, you would go to extreme measures to take care of it. Would you not? Would anybody say, no, I'm just going to ride this one out? May get green green and fall off, but hey, that's just part of it. No, you wouldn't do that. You would go to extreme measures to take care of your physical body. Now, it's even greater when it comes to the spiritual body because God has placed you in a specific place. First Peter, Second Peter, I'm sorry, 3.8 says God has given you everything you need to live a godly life. He didn't leave anything out. You know what? If the enemy is telling you your past mistakes are going to keep you, no. Peter said through the word of God, you've been given everything to live a godly life. That means nothing has been left out. Nothing has been left out. Zero. As my family, as God has given me opportunity as part of the uh, body today to be a mouth, which is a huge responsibility and it scares me to death and praise God, Steve will be back next week. But as today I get the opportunity to be a mouth, I want to ask you to consider to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life with abandonment. Don't be afraid. Don't put more junk on top of whatever's in there. Don't buy the lie of this guy's wacky. (laughs) Don't buy the lie of it's been too long. You've carried this too long. You'll never get rid of this. So everybody kind of Close your eyes. I want you to think about you. Think about God. 
You think about the Holy Spirit in you. The power, if it's really true, if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, you think about where the Holy Spirit is showing up in your life right now. If you're looking around, that's probably what you're thinking about. So I challenge you, close your eyes. Fix the eye of your mind on the Spirit of God the best way you know how. And I want you to ask the Spirit, the powerful Spirit who's been placed perfectly in you by the very Creator of you. What is in my life that has not been pierced by the light of God Almighty? What is it? Some of you here this morning came up with something pretty quick. I'm going to ask you to do something a little uncomfortable. Nobody's looking around. It's just me and some other people that love you. We're family. But if God placed something on your mind almost immediately of what you'd not allow, the light of God created through his Holy Spirit to illuminate, if God placed something on your mind immediately, would you just slip up your hand real quick and back down? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, The Holy Spirit is working in this place. Thank you back there. The Holy Spirit is drawing you right now in power to deal with that which you've buried in your life. For some of you this morning, you've never met God the Creator. You've never met Jesus. You've never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know that there's a block there. Something's not right. You know what? Just remember Paul called out the beautiful gifts and how great that church looked. But he said, you're unspiritual. So I want to ask you to be honest here. This is another time. If you know without any doubt right now, maybe for the first time, maybe in a confirmed time and time again, but if you know right now that you've never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in your life for salvation, meaning you know God, you know Jesus, would you just slip up your hand and write back down? You know. Okay. And lastly, the Holy Spirit dealing in your heart. If you'd say, I want to experience the Holy Spirit in the fullness of its power like I've never experienced before. Would you raise up your hand and put it back down? Thank you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you. We're going to do something a little different. You can look up. There's some signs over here that perhaps speak to where you are, speak to be hindering you. There are some people there in the parlor, which is right out these doors, where you can go out the back doors, and it has a big sign that says parlor. If you would like some extended time to just pray with somebody, just to talk to a family member, they're there. You feel free. Just go out that door anytime when we stand up here in a minute. So it won't be awkward for you. There are going to be people down here in just a minute. I'll be down here pray with you, to encourage you. But if you'd really like the light of God, the Holy Spirit, to shine on that which maybe has never had the light or the Holy Spirit shine on before, this is your time to let your family, the body of Christ, walk alongside you and do this. Don't miss the time. So as we stand here in a moment, the invitation is clear. People in the parlor, they'll pray with you all afternoon if you want. They will listen. They will encourage. They will love you. The people down front that will be here shortly will do the same thing. If we're family, we need to act like family. I love you guys because I have new eyes. I want you to have new eyes not talking salvation here. We're talking power. Eyes to see like God sees.
please don't miss this time. Join me as, as we uh, have a time of response and invitation. Please. 